Hey, what's up YouTube? Welcome back to Intuition. Today's video, we're gonna continue solving Netflix problems. Today, we're gonna be doing a stats video. All right, stay tuned. In today's video, we're gonna be answering three stats questions. These questions should give you really good practice uh, from what I've been hearing from other students who have taken the exam. Seems that math is a big portion of the exam. For some students, it's been half of the exam, which makes sense because the math and the calculation are a big part of pharmacy, no matter what area you work in, right? Whether it's retail or hospital, you gotta remember how to do your pharmacy calculation, so. All right, so we're gonna be answering these three questions. So let's dive into it. Question number one. Okay, question number one states, a new drug for COPD was tested in 2,500 patients and was found to increase FEV1 scores by an average of 10%. The data outcome was a normal distribution with a standard deviation of 3%. Approximately how many patients had an FEV1 improvement in the range of 13 to 16%. Okay, so we're being told that there's a new drug for COPD and the efficacy of the drug was based on patient improvement in their FEV1, which is the force, which is the force expiratory volume, right? That's just how how hard the patient is able to blow out air. This drug did pretty well for the average patient. It increased their FEV1 score by 10%. But we're being asked how many patients had an improvement between 13 and 16%. Okay, so how do we figure this out? The biggest clue in this question is that is that the outcome was a normal distribution, right? Which is perfect because we know what a normal distribution looks like. A normal distribution is a bell curve, right? When it comes to a normal distribution, it's a bell curve, which means that it's symmetrical. Half the people did worse than the average and half the people did better than the average. The average and the median are the same number in a normal distribution, right? So the average falls right in the middle for a normal distribution. Also for normal distribution, a big property of it is the standard deviation. 68% of all the patients are within one standard deviation and 95% of all the patients are within two standard deviation and 99% are within three, right? Basically everybody is covered within three standard deviations for the most part, okay? So those are the things that we have to remember for a normal distribution. Now we're being asked for how many patients fall between 13 and 16%. Well, we need to figure out how many standard deviations away from the mean is 13 and 16%. Well, we're being told the standard deviation is 3% and the average was 10. So 13 is three away from 10, which means that 13 is one standard deviation from the average. And therefore 16% is two standard deviations away from the mean. So we're being asked to find the number of patients who are within one and two standard deviations. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. So for one standard deviation, we know that 68% of the patients are going to fall within one standard deviation. But here's the thing, 68% on both sides, right? Right now, we're talking about standard deviation only on the greater half of the curve, right? So 68% of the patients fall within one standard deviation, which means that 34% will be on the right side and 34% will be on the left side. So between 10 and 13, 34% of patients are within 10 and 13. Now, how many patients are within 10 and 16? Well, that's two standard deviations away, right? And two standard deviations covers 95% of patients, but we're only talking about one half of the curve. So 95% divided by half, that's gonna be 47.5%, right? So there's 47.5% patients between 10 and 16, and there are 34% of patients between 10 and 13. So we do 47 and a half minus 34. So that way we get the patients between 13 and 16. And that's gonna be equal to 13.5% of patients, right? Okay, so 13.5% of all the patients are going to fall between 13% and 16%. And how many patients is that? 13 and a half percent of 2,500 is approximately 340. So the answer would be answer choice D. All right, so let's go on to question number two. Question number two states, a recent clinical trial study shows that a new drug for dyslipidemia reduced triglyceride levels in 80% of patients treated with the new drug compared to only 60% of patients treated with standard therapy. How many patients would you need to treat with this new drug to have five more patients obtain lower triglyceride levels compared to standard therapy? Okay, so this is a number needed to treat question. Number needed to treat question are very easy questions. You don't wanna get them wrong. So let's make sure that we get this one right. Okay, so what's going on here? So we have a new drug that's being developed for dyslipidemia 
and it's being compared to a standard therapy. For the patients who were treated with this new drug, 80% of these patients ended up having lower triglyceride levels. So this drug worked for 80% of patients. Compared to standard therapy, only 60% of those patients ended up having lower triglyceride levels. How many patients will we need to treat with the new drug to have five more patients develop lower triglyceride levels? With number needed to treat question, you just put the number out there, give that number a variable name. We're gonna call it N, N patients. Now, if we treat N patients with the new drug, we know that this drug is going to work for 80% of them. So 0.8 N patients will have lower triglyceride levels. And then we subtract away the number of patients who would end up having lower triglyceride levels if we treat them with the standard therapy. And we're being told only 60% of them will have lower triglyceride levels. So, so we do 0.8 times N minus 0.6 times n and we want this difference to be equal to five because we want five more patients to have lower triglyceride levels on the left hand side we just factor out the n and we have n times 0.8 minus 0.6 equals five and we divide both sides by 0.8 minus 0.6 so that's five divided by 0.2 and five divided by 0.2 equals 25 and so we will need to treat 25 patients with the new drug to have five more patients obtain lower triglyceride levels. Told you these questions are easy, so uh, make sure you get them right. All right, question number three. A new study is being designed to assess the impact of a new antimicrobial, Staph killer X, on the mortality of patients with MRSA endocarditis. To control for confounding variables, the patient's age, sex, and comorbidity index are recorded. Which of the following answer choices best matches the confounding variables to their data type? Okay, so another straightforward question, right? It's going to be a study on a new drug called Staph Killer X, and this drug is going to be used to treat patients with MRSA endocarditis, right? Which is a very severe uh, infectious disease. Now, they want to see how well the drug works, but in order to see how well this drug works, they're going to have to control for confounding variables because some patients are going to be more sick than others, some patients are going to be older than others. So these are confounding variables that can impact whether a patient lives or die from this disease irrespective of the drug so we need to control for these variables and in this question we're being asked to classify these types of variables so let's go ahead and take a look at the answer choices and see which answer choice makes the most sense for categorizing these variables answer choice a says sex is a continuous variable age is an interval variable comorbidity index is a nominal variable okay what do you guys think about that one with this one the biggest one i have issue with is the comorbidity index being a nominal variable. Comorbidity index is going to be a number, so it's going to be a numerical variable. Remember, a nominal variable is just a name, which means that it's purely a categorical variable, which means that there's no number attached to it. Comorbidity index, there's going to be a number attached to that, so that's going to be wrong right off the bat. Okay, B, sex is a nominal variable. Age is a continuous variable. Comorbidity index is an interval variable. That one I like because it makes a lot of sense, right? Sex is just a name, right? F male or female, that's it. Age could be listed in terms of interval data or it could be a continuous uh, data because you can break age into groups, right? You can say child, adolescent, you know, young adult, elderly, and these are different age categories. And if you chop, if you took age and chopped it up into intervals, it will be interval data. But in this question, we're not told that, that the patients were put into age categories. It just says that their age was simply listed. And if age is going to be simply listed, then that means that age is going to be a continuous variable because a person could be any age. So age will be continuous variable in this case. It won't be interval data. So I would agree that age, that age should be continuous variable. So the best answer here is answer choice B. And that is the correct answer. All right, so there you guys have it. I hope that studying is going well. Videos are going to be coming out every week. I'm not one to withhold information from you guys. And I uh, definitely want to help to make a brighter and smarter world. So I hope you guys continue to watch the videos. And uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And as always, I'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye.